Hello, my name is Aka Semi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies at UC Berkeley. On behalf of the Institute and our partner, the Pacific Regional Office of the German Historical Institute, I would like to welcome all of you to our second lecture this fall in our German and European History series at our Institute, this time featuring Professor Tiffany Florville for her talk, Borderless and Brazen. My IAM's Internationalism. This lecture would not be possible without the generous support of Mrs. Norma von Ragenfeld Feldman and the German Academic Exchange Service, both of whom we thank. A few housekeeping details. After the lecture, audience members are welcome to enter their questions into the chat located at the bottom of your screen or to raise your hand with the icon. Now, we're very grateful uh, to Professor Stephen Small, professor in the Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley and director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, also at UC Berkeley, who has graciously agreed to moderate this discussion. I now pass the floor to Professor Small to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, Akasemi. It's my pleasure to be here. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone who's joining us today. As Akasemi said, my name is Stephen Small. I'm a professor in African American studies, and I've been here since 1995. I'm also the director of the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues. I was born and raised in Liverpool, England, and I carry out research and teach on the sociology and the political economy of the African diaspora in the United States and Western Europe. So welcome today. I have the pleasure of introducing today's guest and moderating the questions and answers. Professor Tiffany Florval from the University of New Mexico, where she's in the Department of History and has taught there since 2013. Professor Florval works on 20th century Europe, Germany, gender and sexuality, race and ethnicity, war and society, politics and economy, and the frontiers and borderlands. In addition to the book she will introduce to us today, Professor Florville has written several articles that revolve around the Black German movement and its transnational connections, as well as gendered aspects of Black German activism. Together with Vanessa Plumley, Professor Florville co-edited a recent volume, Rethinking Black German Studies, Approaches, Interventions, and Histories. That book was published in 2018. Professor Florval has also worked with the German Studies Association. She's a digital humanist, and she serves as the co-founder and network editor and advisory board member for the H Black Europe and a co-founder a co and network editor of H Emotions. And that's not all. Professor Florval also blogs for Black Perspectives, which is published by the African American Intellectual History Society and is part of the transnational group Black Central Europe. In today's presentation, Professor Florval will be presenting her most recent book, Mobilizing Black Germany, Afro-German Women and the Making of a Transnational Movement, a timely and valuable insight into Black women in Germany and their legacies. Today's event is entitled Borderless and Brazen, My Ayim's Internationalism. And Professor Flova will speak for approximately 25 minutes. And then there'll be a short conversation between Professor Flova and myself as moderator, and there'll be time for questions. So welcome Professor Flova and over to you. Thank you, Professor Small, for that lovely introduction. And I'm honored to be later in dialogue with you um, after my presentation. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Um, please bear with me. Hopefully the PowerPoint slide hasn't completely disappeared. Oh, hold on, it has. Um, just give me a second here. Okay, all right. So it should be able to share now. Can everyone see that pretty much? Okay, so that helps. Show. Okay. 
All right, without further ado, I also wanna just briefly say thank you to the GHI West, as well as Asakimi and Ray and others who've helped organize this. I'm really delighted to be here and I actually appreciate everyone who's attending. I'm, I know Zoom fatigue is real, so I certainly appreciate you taking the time to listen to me talk. <clears throat> Racism and oppression is going to be a current topic in Germany for the foreseeable future which is both terrifying and frightening. However, I do not take it as a reason for resignation, but rather a challenge to stronger action, including, for example, creating more and better strategies and coalitions as national as well as international. Also, as Audre Lorde says, we do not need to become friends, but we must learn to work together. So remarked Maya Ayn to a multinational crowd of black women in Germany at the international fifth cross control Cultural Black Women's Studies Summer Institute in August of 1999, 1991, excuse me. In her presentation entitled Racism and Impression in Unified Germany, I am an author and activist of Guyana in German descent, as well as a leading figure in the Black German movement, recognized the persistence of racial discrimination in a reunified Germany that was seeking international stature. Far from being defeatist, I aim thought these recent challenges should prompt coalitional politics and empowering strategies, themes that the 1991 Institute promoted. I aim's remarks reflected an understanding of how national and international dynamics intersect and connect individuals and how emotions produce opportunities for activism. Her comments at the 1991 Institute also demonstrate how she used an international event to draw attention to the hardships endured by black and people of color in Germany. IEM's participation in the Institute marked her increased transnational activism. Today in this talk, I will focus on how IEM used her experiences and outrage about discrimination in and beyond Germany to shape her writing, her diasporic identity, and political activism. As I argue, her international engagements, organizational commitments, and organizational commitments enabled her to demand equality for individuals of color and to cultivate connections with many across the Black diaspora. This in turn offered Aim a sense of belonging. These bonds also served as a form of cultural survival and a German nation that both excluded and ignored her black Germanness. From Berlin to Johannesburg, Aim's activism made her a black internationalist and provided her with a platform from which she obtained recognition for herself, black Germans and other marginalized communities. She did so while also stressing the persistence of inequality worldwide. Black internationalism, a political, cultural, and intellectual practice against racial oppression, inform both her poetics and politics. But before I discuss her international activism, I'll provide you with some brief context about her life. Brigitta Silva Gertrude, nicknamed Mai, was born in Hamburg to Ursula Andler, a young German woman, and Emanuel Ayin, a Guyanan medical student, on May, May 3rd, 1960 hence the nickname Mai. Her white German mother, like some German mothers of mixed race children, placed her in an orphanage. She remained at the children's home for two years until a white couple from Münster adopted her. She joined the Opitz family, which already had four children. There we go. And I should show you, this is the program from the Black Cultural, um, from the Cross-Cultural Black Women's Studies Institute that Mai spoke at in which I borrowed my, in which I cited her. And then these are some images of Mai as a young child. Mai's adoptive parents were very strict in the hopes that she would become a model student in spite of her heritage, which they believed considered, consisted of allegedly wayward German mother and a Diane and father. Post-war debates about the aberrant behavior of German women who lacked respectability and fraternized with African-American GIs was prevalent. According to officials and ordinary citizens, these German women were from a low social standing, which meant that their class informed their lack of behavior. And these same Germans disapproved of these interracial relationships, which in which the color line was crossed. These discourses reflected a long and complicated history. During the French occupation of the Rhineland from about 1919 to 1930, some, some dated back to 1918, National officials and international activists, including British journalists, 
Edmund D. Morrell espoused racist rhetoric that deemed white German women to be helpless victims who were subjected to the primitive or hypersexuality of French colonial soldiers from Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Madagascar, and Senegal. These soldiers allegedly existed outside the bounds of respectability, and blackness by association was coded as deviant. And here we have a few images of a Moroccan and Madagascan um, infantry unit in Lugusab in 1921. In actuality, these colonial soldiers committed few rapes and white German women readily pursued relationships with them. Germans labeled the French occupation, the Black Hara on the Rhine. The offspring resulting from these relationships were offensively referred to as the Rhineland Bastards. Before the end of World War II, these discourses began to change, especially with regard to German women's respectability. And so these are sort of, um, these are quite uh, prominent images that were circulating in German, um, German magazines. Both of these magazines are actually um, satirical journals from Germany depicting the, um, the Rhineland occupation. And so we see how um, French colonial soldiers are depicted as certainly you know, um, defiling German women, they're bestial, and these are the sort of um, stereotypes um, and assumptions that were circulating during the time. As historian Heidi Fehrenbach has noted, the debates about German women during the interwar periods evolved from victims of invading enemy hordes into willing and willful fraternizers who perpetrated a natural be national betrayal of missing or maimed German men in order to indulge their craving for material goods and pleasures. So here again, we see in the interwar period, these women are helpless victims. In the post-1945 post, um, period, they're considered you know, perpetrators. They're sort of you know, willingly engaging in these relationships with um, African-American soldiers. Of course, these latter discourses shaped reactions to children of mixed race descent following World War II, even those who, like Aim, were not descended from occupying forces. After spending her unhappy childhood and youth in the Opitz household, Aim left maintaining sporadic contact with her family. She studied and traveled to Israel, Egypt, Kenya, and Ghana, where she connected with her biological father and family. In 1984, at the age of 24, she moved to West Berlin. The city shaped her black radical politics and helped her forge ties with people of color and other black activists, especially Caribbean American poet, Audre Lorde. And the bottom image of Audre Lorde is actually in Berlin. Lorde was visiting professor in 1984 at the John F. Kennedy Institute for North American Studies at the Free University, where she taught three courses. Lorde's tenure at the university was due in part to white, German West, um, white West German feminist and FU lecturer Dagmar Schultz. And one of I, Lorde's I, Lord's aims with the trip, excuse me, was to meet with Black German women. So she knew about them and wanted to seek connections with them. By attending some of these seminars at the Free University, Aim met other Afro-Germans, including Katerina Ogontoya, who was of Nigerian and East German descent. Aim's and Ogontoya's exchanges with Lord, as well as with one another, helped them cultivate a new diaspora consciousness, one that led to the creation of a new lexicon, with the designations of Afro-Germans or Afro-Deutsche and Black Germans or Schwarze Deutsche, in which they were basically self-styling and making their diasporic identity legible. These empowering new, this empowering new language was also an epistemic intervention that enabled Black Germans to enter the public sphere on their own terms. And here is a great image of Mai has a sort of, uh, intricately designed shirt. Um, um, Audre Lorde is in the middle and then Katarina is in a black shirt. Given their exchanges, I aim and Ogantoya along with others, including David Niadi, Abina Adamako, John Kantara, Eleonora Wiedenroth Kolabi, and other black Germans established two associations. The Initiative of Black Germans or ISD, or Initiative Schwarze Deutsche, and Afro-German Women, or Adefra, or Afro-Deutsche Frauen. And here there are two brochures, one certainly from the regional chapter, both of the regional chapters of um, ISD in both Munich um, and the, the Adefra brochure from 1993. 
The movement entailed the collaboration of men and women, but it was pioneered and led by Afro-German feminists. Some of those feminists were Ogun Toya, Jasmine Edding, Eva van Persch, Elke Jank, and Judy Gumlich. And several of these feminists also identified as queer and dealt with a double insider outsider status as both black and queer. In many ways, I aim along with other black German women practice a queer diasporic sense of belonging. What literary theorist Nadia Ellis analyzed in her book, Territories of the Soul. Black German women continually destabilized and defied heteronormative understandings of kinship, the diaspora and the nation through their activism and embraced an intersectional political process. Here, queer was not con connected to same-sex desire or relationships alone. As an early leader in the movement, Aim produced and shared knowledge that rooted Blackness in Germany and normalized Afro-German identity. Across German, Germany, local ISD and ADEFRA chapters allowed members to assist with this task and aided them as they challenged their erasure from the nation. Their modern movement ushered in a new stage of diasporic activism, firmly rooted in Germany, even as it also extended beyond it. Moreover, the groundbreaking Afro-German Afro -German anthology, Bob Kennen, Afro-Deutsche Frauen auf den Spüren ihre Geschichte, later published by the University of Massachusetts Press, as Showing Our Colors, Afro-German Women Speak Out in 1992, signaled Aim and Ogentoya's cultural and intellectual intervention and reflected Lord's impact. We have the original um, book as well as the um, translated. Um, cover of the book. Schultz Feminist, Feminist Press, Orlando, published the collection in 1986, and the volume included poetry, interviews, autobiographical texts, and Aim's master's thesis from the University of Regensburg. Fab Buchanan also represented effective layers of meaning making and knowledge production. In the process, they unearthed a Black German archive of feeling, rendering Black German women Hood visible and privileging their public culture. Fab began and catalyzed the movement, allowing Afro-Germans to find a sense of kinship and representation. Aim remained active in the movement by assisting with organizational events, including the Berlin Black History Month celebrations, inaugurated in 1990. Modeled after the annual US observations, observances, excuse me, by Carter G. Woodson, the BHM served as invented traditions that affirmed the importance of the Black diaspora within German daughters and beyond it. It's also provided a source of continuity and sociability within the movement. Her activism in the BHM events persuaded her to make broader connections and identify international issues that both paralleled and differed from the Black German case. Aim found some affinities with struggles against South African apartheid that resembled European dynamics, including the rise of conservatism throughout fortress Europe, neo-Nazi violence, and harsh naturalization and immigration legislation. The Black History Months featured seminars, workshops, and other activities, and entailed collaboration with local Black, people of color, and immigrant organizations or migrant organizations. And here are two sort of, um, one is the brochure from the first um, BHM, and the other is a brochure from the 1992 BHM. ISD's BHMs were also a collective form of international outreach, a practice I am continued at the 1996 one, sadly her last. She arranged a talk at this last, at this um, BHM, entitled, All Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, Racism from the Afro-Feminist Perspective which borrowed its title from the 1982 African-American Feminist Anthology. In the presentation, Aim investigated how racism and sexism manifest themselves in the personal, professional, and political fields, and what strategies can evolve from, from uh, individual and collective change. She showed the impact of Black feminism as a political tool for Black Germans. Aim also remained committed to a variety of causes, that focus on migrant and black uh, women as thinkers and writers. For example, she co-created co a space for women of color and black women with the organization Literature, um, Literature Frauen, or Literature Women, 
in 1988 with Dagmar Schultz, Iko Hugo Marshall, and others. Lit Frauen, for short, catered to authors of color by hosting writing workshops and literature conferences. They also assisted women of color authors with publishing and securing more literary recognition. With the 1991 conference, Father, um, Fatherland, Mother Tongue, Fatherland, Mutashraka, Aim fostered lively discussions with participants about women writing in foreign languages and the difficulties that emerged. The conference showed how committed she was to creating vibrant intellectual communities to exchange ideas and share strategies. Aim participated in anti-apartheid demonstrations, gave presentations in Berlin at different venues about racism, sexism, and colonialism. In Berlin, she connected with many from across the Black diaspora, such as South African student Visu Michinu and Dr. Abdul Ali Kamalat, a visiting professor at the Free University in 1986 and 1987, showing that her grassroots internationalism took on many forms within the German nation. So here I want to stress that her internationalism didn't necessarily mean having to leave the borders of Germany. She could still have those internationalist perspectives and um, insight. <clears throat> Aim also derived a key source of political and emotional energy from her writing. It was her poetry, more so than her organizing, that ultimately gave her international acclaim. She performed poetry, including spoken word, in, ma in major German cities. For instance, Aim read her texts and served as a moderator on a panel about women's literature at the 1988 Women of the World Frauen der Welt conference in Berlin. She performed, she enjoyed performing, excuse me, for audiences as it was therapeutic and validated her experiences. It also allowed her to support diverse causes. At the 1993 Frankfurt Book Fair, she participated in Silence is to Blame. German is a colorful language. Schweigen ist Schuld, Deutsch ist eine bunte Sprache, a conference with women of color authors. <clears throat> Connecting with other diasporic writers, Aim also served as a moderator for a 1994 Berlin reading of the Guadalupe author Maze Condé's newly translated book at the time, The Children of Segu, and she later interviewed her. As with other Black diasporic writers, Aim's writing was never devoid of political substance and enabled her to create links that moved beyond mere physical interactions. Publishing Blues in Black White, as her first, vo uh, first volume of poetry in 1995, here's a copy of that. I even proved that her writing and activism remained inseparable. Condi noted in the volumes forward that, and I quote, in Mai's voice, I found the echo of other sounds of the diaspora, end quote. Mai's writing addressed the themes of black identity, belonging and marginalization. The book represented her position as um, represented her position in the Black European canon. Her writing addressed uh, her writing also confronted West Germany society's unwillingness to accept Black Germans as well as other communities of color. It was Aim's poems, Afro German One and Afro German Two, both included in Fab Bekennen and Blues in Black White, Blues in Schwarz Weiss, that helped her gain worldwide esteem. These poems, along with others, were reproduced in countless journals and magazines worldwide. In these poems, she validated Black German subjectivities and their experiences in German culture by recreating a routine exchange. With the poem Afro-German One, I aim depicted a white German woman expressing a degree of incredulousness and fascination about her alleged paradoxical Afro-German identity, uttering, you are Afro-German? Ah, I understand, African and German. An interesting mixture, huh? And these are, so this is a stanza from Afro-German one. I aim and other black Germans were interesting mixtures rather than normal German citizens. Later in the poem, the woman suggests that I aim return to Africa and civilize her people, spreading the ideals of humanity to the lower culture. In Afro-German II, Aim continued to focus on issues of Afro-German identity by unsettling the characteristics that white Germans ascribe to Blackness, as well as individuals of African descent more generally. She tended to connect the differences by focusing on horizontal connections with German minority populations, such as the Sinti and Roma, 
um, Jewish, Asian, and Turkish. German discriminatory practices, exclusionary discourses, and structural racism had an effect on all these minority populations. Working together though, across their differences, truly afforded opportunities for the creation of an anti-racist society. Reaching across borders, Aim became a global citizen who traveled to international forums, book fairs, and conferences. With international invitations, Aim garnered acclaim as an Afro-German intellectual and captivating performer. As Condi expressed, and I quote again, here, um, excuse me, her exceptional voice, unique, already in the hearts of all of us who are persecuted and thirsty, end quote. She used her appeal to bolster her position and to retain recognition. Her lyrical use of the German language in her poetry and prose gave her an opportunity to share knowledge about Afro-Germans and to use that knowledge to connect with others. These exchanges also encouraged her to seek further engagement with anti-racist and feminist causes. But this interest did not mean that she was compelled to accomplish some of this, um, some of this work, not compelled to accomplish some of this work in other European contexts. She promoted collaboration with black women and women of color throughout Europe. She attended the 1992 African Women in Europe conference in London, conveying appreciation to, to the organizers. Aim saw the event as an opportunity to create space for African women to get together and share their experiences and strengthen us in and against a Europe which tries to keep us far from each other and away from power and privileges. The comp this conference, like others, affirmed her desire to improve political dynamics and fortress Europe, a continent that continued to treat non-white Europeans with hostility and that increasingly made European borders impenetrable to refugees and asylum seekers. Participation in this event was empowering and reinforced IEM's bonds to women internationally. At the 1994, Differences, um, racism and feminism, differences in power relations among women, political solidarity, feminist visions, you can't say that five times quickly. Conference in Austria, she interacted with feminist scholars from the United States, such as Ruth Frankenberg and Patricia Hill Collins. These exchanges and her reading from the 1993 edited volume, Distant Ties, which you can see a blurry image of it in the, it is that is the book she's holding in her hand positioned her as a critical intellectual and thinker. Her involvement in these events strengthened her commitment to engage in dialogues about inclusion, exclusion, and to combat discrimination throughout Europe. To further assist her with these goals, she participated in an event suit for UNESCO, the Council of Europe's Roundtable on Human Rights and Cultural, Pol Cultural Politics in a Changing Europe, and the Pan-European Women's Network for Intercultural Action and Exchange. Beginning in 1987, Aim also became a fixture at the Cross-Cultural Black Women's Studies Summer Institute. After the United Nations Decade for Women, 1975 to 1985, the Cross-Cultural Black um, Women's Studies Summer Institute formed with an emphasis on the collective experiences of women, women of color and global South feminism. And here again, this is a basically, she becomes a part of this organization, which is where she's presenting, um, which I mentioned in the beginning of the, the talk. I aim recognize how the national, continental and international impacted black people and people of color at a variety of European venues, including the 1990 Conference on Exclusion and Tolerance, Modern Racism in the Netherlands and the Federal Republic of Germany, the University of Warwick and the Technical University of Berlin's 1993 conference, Discrimination, Raci Racism and Citizenship, Inclusion and Exclusion in Britain and Germany. During the 11th Book Fair of Radical Black and Third World Books in London and it, this fair's 1993 one day conference, Bigotry, Racism, Nazism and Fascism in Europe. She mingled with Jamaican British dub poet, Linton Crazy Johnson, Guyan-born British editor and writer, Margaret Bubsby, and Caribbean-American feminist author, June Jordan. These events confirmed that Aim used her writing to connect with others. Her intellectual activism and intersectional politics converged through her participation in these events. She continued to travel abroad. She traveled to uh, the University of Minnesota's 1994 International Conference, Xenophobia in Germany, national and cultural identities after unification. 
And at this conference, she connected with Leslie Idelson and Uli Linka. She also traveled to uh, Carleton College, Earlham College in DePaul. Later that year, so later in 1994, she also traveled to the a Panifest Symposium in Ga um, Ankara, Ghana, where she continued to enlighten audiences about Afro-Germans' conditions. In 1995, after Nelson Mandela's release, Aim gave a reading of Afro-German One at the Mega Music Festival in Johannesburg and presented at the University of Transkei. She traveled to Durban and participated in a writing workshop there. These presentations not only demonstrate her willingness to impart knowledge about Black German history and culture in diverse forms, but also reveal how she used these events to simultaneously decolonize Western epistemologies. As always, Aim's effective practice of Black internationalism was attuned to international connections and diasporic politics. Though she, um, though she did these events and sustained these relationships, her life remained challenging. In 1986, she suffered from anxiety and depression, spending periods of time in psychiatric wards. Here is a conference from the Minnesota um, conference that she, the brochure from the Minnesota conference that she was a part of, and then her in South Africa. She also suffered from medical racism when she sought treatment in Germany. Indeed, the persistence of racism and sexism had taken their toll. Given these underlying forces, Aim ended her life on August 9th, 1996. In her suicide note, she wrote, and I quote, I have lived and experienced more than many people who are twice as old as me, end quote. As her friend, David Nee Addy noted, her personal courage, her creativity, and her energy were impressive, but her recurring doubts, exhaustion, and anxiety accompanied her until the end. I aim left a rich legacy as a Black German activist intellectual. She forged connections with Black Germans and other people of color in Germany and abroad. I aim, along with other Black Germans, created a cultural and political movement with Bob McKinnon, leading to the founding of their modern movement. She became a political protagonist, mobilizing at the grassroots level in and beyond Germany. Though attending symposiums, excuse me, through attending symposiums, Symposia and workshops, Aim was unabashed about using her international claim to gain more recognition for Afro-Germans and to address issues of bigotry in Germany and Europe. Expanding conversations about racism and the afterlives of colonialism, she demonstrated how local, national, and international dynamics were intertwined. Aim's activism underscored how her embodied internationalism impelled her to cross borders. Yet Mai's ability to be borderless and brazen also entailed vulnerability and courage until the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Florville. A stimulating and highly informative presentation for which we are very appreciative. You bring to us a wide range of issues in Maya Yim's life and you outline some of the ways in which she's had and continues to have a significant impact I like the way that you highlighted how one can be an internationalist without having to travel internationally, although clearly you convey that my traveled internationally. And I think the images that you shared with us are both compelling and palpable. Okay. Uh, knowledge production outside the academy, outside universities is something that's always fallen upon the shoulders of black women, also black men, particularly in Europe, but across the diaspora too. And I think you convey the ways in which she drew upon a wide range of media uh, from poetry and writing to visual imagery uh, to create knowledge by and about and for black women in Germany and across the world. Uh, I should let people know there are a number of questions. There, there is an opportunity to ask questions. I'm going to have you, uh, ask you a couple of questions initially, and then we'll take questions as they come in. Germany is the largest nation, the biggest population in Europe, and has been for a long while. And my understanding is that the majority of black people live in Berlin, which may have been one of the reasons she went. I'm curious about the relationship between black women and people in Berlin with other cities. Uh, in your research, did you find that there were connections between uh, black women across the country? And also, uh, I don't know if this is a relevant question, but 
there are German speakers in Austria and Switzerland elsewhere. And when I met black women from Austria, they told me that Afro-Germans are their heroes or heroines. So I'm curious about the links between Berlin and, and other cities in Germany. Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Professor Small. Berlin was a site for um, black activism, certainly, and it was that's it has sort of larger roots, so sort of longer roots with black activism. Thinking about um, diasporic activism in the 19th century and also in the in the 20th century, or sort of decol, thinking about um, anti-colonial activism. Um, but they they created all of these ISD chapters across Germany. So Berlin is one hub for ISD and Adefra, but there's also, as I mentioned in the slide. Um, uh, Munich, there's also Cologne, there's also Dusseldorf, there's also Hamburg. So they're connecting with uh, all of these Black Germans. And the Black History Month events that take place in Berlin actually bring in um, Afro-Germans from other cities. So this was an opportunity to sort of get together and hang out. Um, in the larger book project, I talk about a, nas uh, a national meeting that Black Germans had um, annually, where they would meet at different locales across Germany. Um, to just have workshops, to just have hair braiding workshops, to talk about, you know, dealing with racism. And so they're really doing a lot to connect with Black Germans across um, Germany. And they're also connecting with um, Afro-Austrian individuals. So there, there are several sort of Afro-Austrians Afro who come over to um, the national meetings to hang out. Um, there also was an effort to connect with Afro-Swiss um, Afro um, individuals. Um, I found some 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 linkages um, during during some during some research, and so I was like, "Oh, I need to find more about this organization." So there was an Afro-Swiss organization that was created in the '90s um, called okay. Colors that also was starting to have this sort of exchange with Black Germans, and they're connecting with um, Black British women. They're connecting with um, so they're for the British. So the British version of Bob Cannon was published. And Gail Lewis wrote the preface for okay. it. Yeah. Um, it so they're, yeah, yeah, so they're connecting to all of these, yeah. you know, dynamic um, diasporic groups across Europe, including Afro Dutch with like Gloria Becker and so Philomena on. Assad, yeah. And exactly, and Philomena Assad. So they are not sort of, um, they no longer want to shoot, they want to sort of break away from their isolation. And so they're very cognizant of forging these connections with all their compatriots across the country. Wonderful, thanks a lot. We have a question here. I'll go to that question first. So the question is, could you please share with us some thoughts on how you use biography as a prism for history or a, or a method for history? And if so, do you have any thoughts on how the genre of biography should change or must change in order to include race and or intersectionality, especially in German speaking history and German studies? That's a, those are some really good questions. So um, my gets a, is a chapter in the book, but I am doing a, I am, I, I am going to write a biography on her. So that's like my new okay. project. Um, and I'm finding it, um, I'm finding like in the sort of African-American diasporic um, literature, there seems to be a resurgence of biographies on black women right now. Um, certainly there's a biography on Fannie Lou Hamer that just came out by Keisha Blaine. There's a new biography or there's a work on a biography by, uh, by Ashley Farmer on um, Queen Mother Moore. So there seems to be a moment where like black um, women are, are, are seem to be deserving of more attention. Um, even though we know that they deserve this attention, there's, this is the moment to sort of talk about them. How I'm structuring the biography on my, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, I think it would be useful to sort of think about when she was born, so 1960, and think about key historical moments that are occurring during her birth, her birth, and her her childhood to sort of maybe situate how those how those events are also shaping her shaping her childhood in Münster, um, and then thinking about um, you know the 19, by 1968, Mai is eight. <laughs> so she has, you know, she does not have a connection to the student activists of that generation. Um, and so I think it's going to behoove me and be useful to me to sort of think about her life through other historical moments while also centering what she means for larger German, um, German history. Like what does her life tell us about um, 
the the silences still surrounding um, issues of race in the German context. So that black lives have always mattered in Germany, but are still not perceived to matter. Um, so I think I need to, I still need to figure out how to sort of do that. But I've been, what's been useful for me in this current moment, because it's a sort of initial stage for the project, is writing, you know, writing a, an outline, you know, writing multiple outlines, dates. So, uh, so outline about when Mai was alive and dead, thinking about historical moments in the Black freedom struggle, thinking about historical moments in German history, and then sort of mapping them to see what um, what enlightening um, aspects I get. Okay, so good. Sort of partially answered your good. question. Thank you. Tell us something about the evidence or data. Where do you find your information, given particularly Germany's national reticence or reluctance or even antagonism to talking about race? Have you been able to find the kind of records and data by and about black women, uh, by and about my IM that, that, that are necessary? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I wrote um, German archives when I was doing dissertation research. And I was like, is there anything about black Germans in your archives? And the constant refrain was, no, we have nothing about them from the 80s yeah. and 90s. Yeah. Um, and so I basically had to reach out to people who I knew were connected um, in the movement. And so I reached out to Dagmar Schultz, who then connected me to Hugo Marshall, who connected me to Rhea Cheatham. I reached out to um, Ricky Reiser, who then connected me to tons of the materials that she was working through when she was the editor for Afro Look, which was okay. a Black German magazine that was published. Mm -hmm. And so it was my personal connections to people who were involved in the movement that helped. Um, reaching out to Katarina Ogantoya, saying, hi, Katarina. Um, can you tell me more about that time? Her inviting me to her home and saying, hey, look, over there is actually when we, where we used to meet for Adefra. Going, oh my goodness, <laughs> like that's crazy. Um, so I think it's basically my personal connections with people that helped me, helped me fashion a, a narrative that would work. Um, and I think I had to find Black Germans in traces in some subcultural archives. So like feminist archives or um, lesbian and gay archives. But um, they weren't a, they weren't visible at the Schulist Museum, which is one of the prominent um, gay archives in Berlin. But they were sort of traces of them in the lesbian archive there, Spinboden. So it was sort of a de de check detective work in which I'm like trying to look for them mm -hmm. in um, in certain areas, even though I knew they weren't going to be in existence there. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question. Uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Did you come across engagement with the idea, the event, the process of German unification and European enlargement in my IM's writing and organizing? Did she address that? And what about Afro-Germans more broadly? Are these issues that they engage with? Yes, um, it's really, I mean, it's because of the, so the, I talked about briefly the Black History Month event and that sort of, it was inaugurated in 1990. They thought about, you know, so the, the initial um, plans for the Black History Month occurred in 1989, but it's at that 1990 um, Black History Month that they decide to come up with like this mega organization that would address um, issues of racial violence that um, black people and people of color were experiencing in um, in Germany, and that was uh, that eventually became sort of exacerbated with the fall of the with the fall of the Berlin Wall in, um, in November um, of 1990. And so they basically create this sort of super organization called the Black Unity um, Committee, mm -hmm. and it's like it, it included members of ISD and other members of local Black and diasporic groups in 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 Berlin. And so what they would do was basically document the instances of racial violence. Um, so they're trying to create a documentary trail um, a documentary trail that like, look, these are these this is happening. Germany is dealing with this right now. Mm -hmm. And they would speak out about um, about German racism in the sort of the persistence of German racism in the after the fall of, um, of the Berlin Wall. And so they were unabashed by talking about, about racism. They were also unabashed by organ um, in organizing anti-racist -dem anti demonstrations across Germany. So Berlin, of course, Berlin is important, but there are demonstrations in Cologne. There are demonstrations in Frankfurt. There are also anti-racist workshops that they helped to, um, they received funding from the World Council of Churches in in Geneva to pursue um, anti-racist training and workshops to help 
change um, change the atmosphere um, and change what knowledge people had in Germany. So they're very cognizant of like the uptick in ethno nationalism in um, in the in the early '90s and quite quite honestly even today. So they're very much keen about talking. Um, about stressing racial profiling as an issue in Germany. Um, there's a racial profiling campaign and the like. So that hasn't disappeared even within the movement. So they're very much about sort of stressing, look, Germany, this is racism. <laughs> we can't say racism doesn't exist when we see the material impacts of it. Okay, thank you. We have another question here. Um, my question is to the, the person says relates to internationalism community building, and in some sense, citations. This person said she's an American studying at a German institute and noticed the tendency to use theories, especially CRT, critical race theory, by American theorists. In my experiences, there is very little effort in finding black and other non-white scholars doing similar work in Germany. Based on your research and experience, is there an asymmetry in this kind of citational practice I presume this means in studies of, of Afro-German women or by Afro-German women. Yeah, I mean, I think you're, these are great questions, Anna. Um, yes, I think there's been a long sort of a dominance of sort of US scholars, US-based scholars who've worked on um, Black German, uh, Black German literature, um, less about sort of Black German history, but more about sort of Black German literature uh, coming from the US and sort of really imposing some of those, um, those theories, but also um, they're engaging with Black German theorists too. So they're not ashamed to engage with like scholars like Peggy Pisha, who is not, you know, who works now at the Heinrich Bull Stiftung in Berlin and is not at, at an is not at like a, a scholarly um, a scholarly institution per se, um, mm -hmm. but she's still um, producing work. She's also was one of the key uh, editors for a whiteness um, a whiteness volume that came out in 2005 in Germany. So like there are um, um, individuals that you can sort of um, link up with. Maisha Uma is also another. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maisha, yeah, yeah, we like, uh, yeah. Maisha is, is amazing. Yeah, um, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. And then Fatima al Taib is based in the US. There's yeah. a reason why she's based in the US, mm -hmm. thinking about these asymmetries and also yeah. being quite honestly about the structural racism that exists. Cool. Um, in, in, in Germany, but there are some. Um, mm -hmm. And there's also this like new generation of black German theorists out there who are mm -hmm. writing. Um, Alice Hester's his, um, is writing stuff. Um, you, have, uh, you have Sharon O'Too, who's a black British woman. Yeah, who's we know based, Sharon, yeah. Yeah, minute, based, yeah. In, based in Berlin. She's mm -hmm. also writing. So we have, there, there are people to sort of draw from. There's also a uh, uh, people who are not necessarily associated with um, universities. I think that's sure. the problem. Um, I think we need to disentangle our idea of who an intellectual is and who can prove um, produce this knowledge. Um, and so there are many people who are doing this. I think about like Philip Cabo Capsule, not at a university, but is writing this stuff, is doing this work. And, and for people who are interested here, are these materials available in German and English? Do we need to have German in order to look at them? Yeah, that's a good question, um, mm -hmm. Professor Small. Yeah, you. some of them are in English. Um, they've published a lot of stuff in English, like Fatima el publishes in English. Mm -hmm. Peggy Pisha has published also in English. Maisha Uma has published in English. Mm -hmm. They've also published in German. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and Philip Cabo Capsul has also published um, in, in English and German. Some of his spoken word poetry is a sort of a mixture of English and German. And if you're interested in sort of catching some of his performances, you can YouTube some of his performances and see him. Um, okay. So yeah, it's a hodgepodge of both English and German. Okay. Um, I wanna ask you about what you may have discovered that you didn't expect when you began your research. But before I do that, I wanna bring in a visiting student, Javita dos Santos Pinto, who's from Switzerland. And she thanks you for your presentation. She has a very specific question in her research on black feminist organizations in Switzerland in the 80s and 90s. She's come to see that many of these were organized around black immigrant women whose migration experience was very important to their experiences of racism, which seems to have led to tensions with Afro-German experiences and narratives. Have you come across documentation about these tensions, I presume between 
black immigrants and black indigenous. Uh, and how would you contextualize these if you've come across them? Yeah, I have come across that. Um, that I mean, in the book, I talk a little bit about that, that like they were involved in um, pushing for um, more uh, less draconian measures in terms of German legislation for asylum seeking and immigration and naturalization. Um, they're also working with migrant feminist organizations. Uh, they're putting on, so they're putting on conferences with migrant, migrant women. So in 1994, there was a conference in Hamburg that was with um, that sort of, I, I um, ADEFRA members, um, the Hamburg chapter put on in, in, in consultation with a, uh, a migrant feminist group that was based mm -hmm. in um, Hamburg. So they're not unabashed about working with these women, but they're also, yeah, you're right. There are also some tensions. I'm not sure I see the tensions as much as say um, this type of organizing in the Afro-Dutch case, mm -hmm. where you think about like um, the migrant, um, the migrant movements um, and uh, migrant activism was a part of um, Afro-Dutch organizing, but also separate from Afro-Dutch organizing. For many uh, Afro-Germans, they saw it as similar and needing to do it. So like ADEFRA hosts a lot of, ADEFRA put on um, an organization, uh, excuse me, not a, well, an organization. They applied for funding called ZAMI to create a space mm -hmm. for migrant women so that they can train them on computer technology. I didn't write about it in the book, sure. but there was funding for them to try to do this so that they could work with migrant women and help them with acquire jobs and um, expertise and skill sets. And so it seems like they're very much, um, yeah. And that, someone mentioned Natasha Kelly in my, yeah, um, in the chat. Yeah. But yeah, so they're very much trying to work together. Um, I, a side project that I'm sort of doing now that I'm supposed to present at a conference in January, we'll see what COVID allows, mm -hmm. um, is about um, the Immigrant Political Forum, which uh, involved some activists who were a part of the um, Black German movement, but also did separate organizing for migrant issues, mm -hmm. for um, immigration in Germany. And I wanna see, um, and I argue that this, these types of organizations are pushing a different type of human rights rhetoric that we don't necessarily see in, the, in, in, in organizations like, um, um, you know, women's rights organizations or other human rights organizations that are in uh, the West German context or the German context. And so I think um, I have to do some more research to figure out, I mean, what are those exact tensions? They exist because tensions okay. exist everywhere. There are tensions in the, the Black German movement between lesbian women and, um, and cis women and cis men, et cetera. But sort of teasing out what those tensions were is also something that I need to work on. Okay. Thank you for that. We have only about five minutes left. I'd like to ask you directly, was there anything, you, you clearly knew a lot about Black German women and a lot about Maya Yim before you began the book. Was there anything that you learned in the process that you didn't expect or that caught you unawares that you think, you know, requires attention or merits attention? Yeah, um, I think I wasn't aware of so when I wrote the book, I was like, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the queerness, the sort of queer implications of my, of my um, sexuality and also her identity. Um, right. Much of that has come out a little bit more after, after the book was published. Um, and so I, that's part of what I want to do with the, the biography is focus more so on that, as well as her sort of mental health issues. Um, I recently discovered that there was a suicide note. Um, I had okay. no idea about that um, when I wrote the book and reading a new book about her. I was like, what? A suicide note. So I need to find the police records. I need to do, you know, I need to I need to do some more sleuthing. Um, and then a second thing I think that surprised me about the project. Was I mean, I knew I was focusing on like writing and, you know, how they you know, how they disseminated this these materials, but I really didn't understand how intellectual they were until I was writing the project re or revising the project mm -hmm. in which I felt like, oh my goodness, they, they're, they're disseminating and producing knowledge. How can they not be perceived of as intellectuals, especially in a German context that, that privileges um, thinkers and philosophers and the like. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, exactly. So I was like, I have to really stress that they are and they remain to this day intellectuals in different ways. Well, look, thank you. We have about three minutes left. Um, I found this very stimulating. You've, I've got 101 questions. 
maybe I can ask one last question yeah. before we go. What I've noticed whenever I'm in Germany and speaking with Afro-German women is that the vast majority of them seem to be of mixed origins with a white yeah. mother or grandmother. And yeah. yet in England, issues of race mixture are widespread and widely discussed. But these issues don't come up so much in Germany. It seems that's not such a... Have you noticed that? Is, is there something you could comment on that? Yeah, that's a very good comment. Um, yeah, I think that was also an issue in the in, in the movement. So you had some who were second generation, third generation, mm -hmm. um, Asian or, um, or African migrants who were in the movement. Um, you also had like biracial um, yeah. uh, um, people who were in the movement. And sort of thinking about what blackness meant for a variety of people sure. was difficult. Um, this idea about uh, mixed race, biracial identity, um, multiracial identity, I think is a common discussion within people in the black community, but not necessarily outside the community. There are also issues of colorism that emerged recently in Germany in which they have a really awesome lifestyle magazine called Wilza Mag. Um, mm -hmm. But a few years ago, there was the images throughout the magazine were of light skinned um, black black women. And so many darker skinned black German women were like, I don't see myself reflected. And so a, 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 a yeah, necessary yeah. conversation emerged about col um, colorism and the, and the implications of that in the German context. So I okay. think it's still an evolving conversation. Okay. Um, I think it's certainly different from the British case. And it's, I'd also argue it's different from the French case. Sure. Um, but I think they're still trying to sort of push some of these discussions to the fore. Um, okay. I'll bite in different ways. Well, look, thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Akasemi, we're going to bring it to a close now. On behalf of the organizing uh, organizers, uh, if I can say that, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Thank you for your fascinating presentation, which I think has clearly been very stimulating. We wish you every success with the promotion of the book and responses to the book. And we wish you every success with your continuing research. I'll turn it over to Akasemi. Thank you so much, uh, mm -hmm. Professor Fleurville, for your excellent presentation. Mm -hmm. And thank you as well, Professor Small, for your uh, very able moderation. And mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank the audience. Thank you to all of you for your engagement. And if you are a UC Berkeley graduate student, please do uh, stay on Zoom as you'll have the opportunity to chat further with Professor Fleurville about your work and hers and where they may intersect. Um, to all of you, have a good evening and a good afternoon. <laughs>